It's time to talk the world's game from an American perspective. Presented by Three Lions Pub, you're listening to Two Up Front, where we focus on all things American soccer. From the NWSL, MLS, U.S. national teams, and all the way to the youth levels. Now in the studio, your hosts, Baxter Colburn and Simon Provan. Hi everybody, welcome to the next edition of Two Up Front, presented by Three Lines Pub. I am Baxter Colburn, no Simon Provan this week. I know I led you astray last week. I said that Simon would be back after being uh, gone with his family on a great little vacation. They got to go on the Laura Ingalls Wilder uh, excursion. Uh, they were all over the country, it looked like, from the pictures that I was seeing. Uh, but he actually uh, has some other obligations that came up for this week. Uh, So he will not be back with us this week. Uh, But we we found a a very competent and capable co-host again, uh, which we'll uh, we'll introduce that person uh, in just a moment. Uh, We've got a lot of great stuff coming up for you on the show today. Uh, Obviously, a lot of different news circulating in the men's and women's soccer worlds. Uh, But we'll get to all of that. We're going to be joined a little bit later in the program by Seattle Rain player Lauren Barnes. It's going to be great to get her. Her making her debut. Yes, do join the program via the shopfutsal.com call-in line. Uh, We are also broadcasting here on Spreaker.com, on iTunes. Make sure to subscribe. Uh, We're also on iHeartRadio as well, too. So if you've got the iHeartRadio app or if you just go to iHeart.com, search for Two Up Front will pop up up there and you can give us a listen or a download and take us anywhere you go. I usually like to listen to the show back. I know it's weird. Is it is it weird to listen to a show that you host? I I go back and listen. It's how you get better, right? You critique yourself. So, I go back uh, and listen as well to uh, on all of these platforms uh depending on what I'm doing with myself. Uh, you can also find the show, of course, uh, by going to our website, 2upfrontsoccer.com. Uh, go over to Facebook and Twitter as well, too, 2 Upfront, uh, 2 Upfront Soccer uh, on Twitter, at Baxter Colburn, at Simon Provan, if you want to get at us uh, on that one. All right, um, so as I mentioned, I've got a co-host again this week, uh, subbing in. Uh, we weren't exactly sure if the paperwork was going to get done in time, but we did find out that uh, the sponsorship, as we mentioned uh, last week, for those that tuned in, uh, Rachel Wood, former Boston Breakers defender, uh, spent time with me here in the studio. Uh, and apparently she was sponsored by Julie Foudy last week, and Julie decided to re-up again for another week. So uh, we have Rachel Wood back with us again this week, courtesy of Laudy Foudy. Uh, welcome back <laughs> to Two Up Front, uh, Rach. Great to have you back. Thank you for having me back. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. We're glad that we can get all the uh, the legalities and the, the paperwork sorted out there and uh, to have Julie sponsor you back for one more week. Julie's a great gal, you know. She's always, you know, she's always um, willing and able to help. She's a so, team player. She's very, always... very appreciative of that, yes. Exactly. She's, uh, she's, she's the real MVP in this whole scenario. <laughs> When is she not? Right, exactly, exactly. We uh, we're very we're very thankful for that. But uh, and of course, uh, for those that tuned in last week, uh, we did have the inaugural edition of Rachel's book club. Uh, so we'll actually have that returning uh, in just a little bit as we get into the kick around. So for those that are waiting, that read the the the, the homework chapters uh, for the week uh, that Rachel assigned somewhere, I'm sure. Uh, we can we can hear. I was gonna say, did I assign homework? Uh, I don't think you did, but you know, we'll we'll say you did to make it sound more official, like you you know gave people our <laughs> gave our listeners a, a reason to go. I mean, you told people to go get the book. That was that was about it. So you know, hopefully they. they... I did, and I, I you know I, I give the book a pretty hard sell because it is an actually fantastic book. Um, so if if you know if my words didn't sell you on it, uh, I don't you know. Gotta, I say, you're, tell you. you're in the wrong career then. If you're if you're in sales, then you gotta gotta move on, find a new <laughs> career. Uh, all right. Well, Rachel, uh, as we mentioned last week as well, too, if people want to find you on social media, they can get you on Twitter for the two times a year that you check it, uh, rmwood24, correct? That is correct, yeah. Sweet deal. rmwood24, at Baxter Colburn, at Simon Proven, at the number two, two up front soccer on the Twitter universe. All right. Uh, the kick around, as we talked about, uh, some news happening uh, out of the women's soccer world, but also really just uh, affecting U.S. soccer as a whole. Uh, it was announced just a couple of days ago that uh, longtime uh, mover and shaker uh, Tony DeChico passed away. Uh, I, I thought it was a little bit sudden. Um, I didn't know, obviously, very much about the, the situation. Uh, but dying at the age of 68, uh, of obviously way too, uh, way too early. Uh, and, uh, according to the statement that the family did release, uh, they said, while the health challenges Tony faced were confronted head-on and with eyes open, uh, we never could have foreseen the beautiful journey that truly defined the magnificence of this man's life. 
Uh, they said in a full uh, statement, uh, his son, Anthony, posting it on Twitter with a full statement. But, Rachel, I want to get your thoughts and opinions about this because uh, you obviously played women's professional soccer uh, and obviously spent time up in Boston as well, too, which uh, Tony was very influential in uh, in the old WPS days as well, too. But uh, what were your thoughts when you heard this uh, saddening news about Tony? I was shocked, to be honest. I I got a text message saying that he had passed, and I, again, I, I didn't know he was sick. I didn't know he was ill. Um, you know, I, I'd seen him a couple of times, whether it was, you know, um, around Boston or, you know, doing some of the, the commentary work that he had done. And, uh, you know, coming from a medical family, I, I, you know, I pride myself a little bit in, in, in sort of being um, receptive and alert to, you know, to some signs. And I, I didn't see any. It was completely out of the blue. Um, and a lot of people have really been affected by this. I mean, you know, he he's been so influential in women's soccer. And I thought that some of the statements that some of his former players had released uh, really did a good job of sort of summing him up. You know, Mia Hamm had released a statement saying that he never pretended that he knew everything and, you know, that he was always open and willing to learn. And that really gave her a confidence to know that she didn't have to be perfect all the time. And I just thought, wow, you know, what a, what a great statement. And, and, how how nice must it have been to play for a man like that? And you know he was he was in the the early um, editions of the league, and he was down um, helping Houston out, uh, consulting for them when they first came into the league in 2014. You know, he's done commentary. He's really I, he's been through sort of every avenue of the game, and to lose such an influential coach and I think mentor and role model to so many so suddenly um, has really sort of shaken the soccer world. And I know that um, the Breakers will be doing something for him uh, at their Pride game on Saturday against North Carolina. So, you know, tune in to sort of, you know, to see what's going on up in Boston because he, he, he coached for the Breakers and is very close to the organization. So they'll definitely be doing something special for him on Saturday. Absolutely, yeah. And just as a quick recap for those that uh, don't know much about Tony DiCicco, um, just a, a brief little statement here uh, that was on the NWSL website. Uh, DiCicco spent uh, 1991 as the goalkeeper coach for the women's national team before he became the head coach in 94. Uh, during his tenure, this is ridiculous to me, he went 103-8-8 during his time uh, leading the team to the FIFA Women's World Cup title, of course, in 99, the very uh, influential and monumental uh, win that was for them. He also helped them win the gold medal at the Olympics in 96 uh, in Atlanta, uh, and his USA team finished third at his first major international tournament in 95 uh, in the uh, Women's World Cup in Sweden as well, too. That's just a very brief uh, gloss over of what he's done in his career. And I don't feel like those three sentences do justice to what exactly he did for the game. And as you mentioned as well, too, Rachel, uh, looking at some of the former players that he coached, uh, as you mentioned, you mentioned Mia Hamm. Uh, Julie Foudy, of course, also chimed in. She said, Tony was one of the finest to grace this planet. His spirit was indeed, um, his spirit will indeed live in us all. Uh, Tony, he's like, I, she said, I smile through the, uh, through these tears. Uh, his impact was immense. So you can, you can really see what it mean, what it meant to these ladies to play for him, especially that 99 team that had such a, a, a massive impact on the growth of soccer as a whole in the United States. Yeah, no, I just, he's been such an influential, um, part of the culture of, of women's soccer. And I think any women's soccer fan, knows the name Tony DiCicco, you know, whether you, whether you follow the 99ers or whether you were a part of um, the league today and, and, and you're a fan, you've seen him on TV. And I think he's going to be a presence that will be truly missed. Absolutely. All right. Uh, moving away from that, uh, one of the other things that's taking place right now uh, in the soccer world for the international level uh, we don't really hear much about it right now here in the United States just because the U.S. is not playing in this tournament because they failed to beat Mexico in the Confederations Cup Championship round-robin weird sort of made-up tournament just to appease the talking heads. I don't know. That, if, for those that remember, the U.S. and Mexico played in a little little one-off thing uh, about a year or so ago. But <laughs> the Confederations Cup is going on right now over in Russia. Uh, this is the warm-up for eight teams uh, before they, the actual World Cup kicks off next year. I feel like we just had a World Cup, and all of a sudden, four years is almost boop, gone just like that. So pretty incredible in that regards. But eight teams are there right now. Uh, Russia, Mexico, Portugal, New Zealand are in Group A. 
and then Chile, Germany, Australia, and Cameroon are in Group B. Only one game each has been played for all these teams. Chile and Germany each got victories in their opening game. Russia as well got a victory in that one. Mexico and Portugal, certainly the talk of the first round with a 2-2 draw as Portugal thought they were going to continue to pull away. Mexico continued to find answers, tying the game at 1-1 and then ultimately nodding it up at 2-2 uh, to stun the Portuguese, as some might say. But uh, the Confederations Cup, as we as we mentioned, Rachel, we are here in the United States getting ready for the Gold Cup, uh, which, of course, the United States uh, usually does pretty darn well in from the men's side. The women's team is actually gearing up for a tournament at the end of July, early August as well, too. Uh, so we're not really focusing on the Confederations Cup. Do you think that, from any perspective, really, that the U.S. is really missing out on much by, by not being here and playing some of, yes, the better teams, obviously, in the Chiles and the Germanys and even Portugal as well, too. But do you feel like the U.S. men's national team is missing out much before they, they have to play the World Cup next year? I think you can I think you can look at it one of two ways. I think you could say, yes, they're missing out because this is a great opportunity in a very, you know, World Cup-like setting to play some of these great teams, right? You're over in Russia. You can kind of get a sense of the atmosphere and, um, you know, you're playing some of the best teams in the world. That said, however, um, I think that with Bruce Arena coming in and, and him being a new coach, he really needs time to sort of evaluate and see these players. And so I think just getting minutes under their belt and really just trying to work out the formation that they're going to play, the system that they're going to play, I think they just need games period and they need they need time together so in one sense yes maybe they're missing out a bit in russia however i think that by them preparing for the gold cup and you know getting time in in camp and having the chance to you know be in front of arena and and really letting him sort of put his mark on this team is really good for them so in that so in that sense no they aren't missing out so i think you know again you can choose to look at it one of two ways but either way because the team is getting minutes they're playing I think it's a win for them. Yeah, and I would agree with you as well, too. The more that you're together as a team, obviously, is mutually beneficial for all parties involved, regardless if you're playing a high-quality Germany or if you're playing a, a Chile. or No, not a Chile. If you're playing a Costa Rica or you're playing a, a New Zealand or something like that. Granted, they're not on the same level, but you're still getting the team together. You're still playing international minutes with guys that don't play together all the time. It's it's great to say that, oh, you know, well, they've they've appeared on the national team together, you know, 45 times together or something like that but when you're not playing with the same players day in and day out it's a little different and sometimes we'll even see that on the women's side as well too where this obviously when the u.s women's national team is together they are arguably the best in the entire world but it always takes them a little while to to get those pieces back together uh because it's a chemistry thing it's a knowing where the runs are going to be it's a knowing who's going to shoot from where and the follow-ups and the, the calls off of off the balls for the goalkeepers and her center backs as well too so it, some of that takes a little bit of time. And honestly, the U.S., they would have had to play Russia, Portugal, and New Zealand. Portugal would have been the only real game in that scenario that have been like, well, good, we need the United States needed this opportunity. Russia would, of course, I'm sure, been a fun game because those teams are pretty aligned, honestly, with how they're, they're playing right now. New Zealand should have been an easy three points as well, too. So I don't think the U.S. is missing out on much considering the teams they could have played uh, in this Confederation, Scott, personally. I don't know if you've got a rebuttal to that or not, Rage. Uh, you know, I don't. I I just I happen to agree with you. I think um, just getting minutes under their belt is the most important thing, and especially at this high of a level, we all know the X's and O's. We all know what runs we're supposed to make, but we're all human as well. And so, finding that chemistry and really finding you know the players that you're playing around, sort of their habits and the runs they like to make, that's what's most important. Exactly, and I think ultimately. The United States, as they gear up for this Gold Cup, uh, they're not going to be flashing all of their big stars either in this Gold Cup. No Christian Pulisic likely um, for this one because of the new coach out in Dortmund. Uh, plus, in general, there's there's other guys that need the minutes as well, too. So we'll get into the Gold Cup stuff a lot more, obviously, as we get more information revealing about that as well, too. If you've got a thought about the Confederations Cup, I know the Mexico fans, of course, uh, are always very excited about this. So I'm sure uh, those out there listening that are Mexico fans, uh, let us know your thoughts about how the team has been doing so far. Uh, all right, before we run out of the kick around and go into our next segment, obviously, uh, we, I don't know if you've got any updates for us, Rachel, about the book club. Have you read more of uh, Julie Foudy's leadership book? What, what do you have for us for this week's edition? 
I have read more. Like I said, I think I'm about halfway through the book now. And again, it's just so much more of the same good stuff. Uh, just talking about confidence and you know, not being afraid to make a mistake and, and really being true to who you are and being authentically you. And I love, I sort of, I just really love the idea of being authentically you because there are so many different ways in which you can lead. There are silent leaders, there are vocal leaders, there are leaders who lead by example. And I think what's most important, and she really stresses this in her book, is is to be you and, and to be you 100%. And when you can do that, you bring so much more to a team, to a work environment, to relationships than you would if you're trying to be something that you're not. And that's and that's a message that really resonates with me. And that's a message that I really try to send to my girls every time I coach them is, you know, we're all different, but we're all we're all special and we all have a gift. So find what your gift is, you know, harness it and just get out there and share it with the world. So I've really I've really been enjoying the book. And again, you should you should go buy it, read it. It's called Choose to Matter and it's fantastic. Perfect. Well, there you go. That way it's uh, this week's edition of uh, the book club here with Rachel. Uh, as she's filling in here for Simon as well, too. We are going to run to our first break when we come back. We're going to look towards the NWSL because there's a lot of things that need to be said. I am on the ship that the league does not want Sky Blue to be successful. We'll talk about that and much more when we come back. It's Two Up Front, presented by Three Lines Pub. Back after this. Welcome back to Joe Front, presented by Three Lines Pub. I am Baxter Colburn. No Simon Trovan this week. He's off again, but he'll maybe be back next week? I don't know. I'm going to start putting question marks after that now when I say he'll be back, because you never know. Uh, it's the summertime, though. Simon spends nine months of his year in a classroom teaching and educating the youth of America, so I don't blame him for wanting extra time off to go spend with his family and do other outside things that... Uh, don't always, you know, that he gets tethered to Milwaukee basically for nine months. So I, I don't blame him at all for wanting to go out and explore the wide world that is out there with his family and uh, other exciting adventures as well, too. But uh, as you've been listening, uh, Rachel Wood is here with me again this week. So she's subbing in. So great to have you, Rach. Uh, obviously. Great to be back. So uh, wonderful, wonderfulness, of course, uh, just spewing from our mouths early on. Uh, as we talked a little bit in the first segment uh, about Tony DeChico passing and his legacy uh, and also the Confederations Cup and Book Club as well, too. So we've gotten a lot of those formalities and a lot of those uh, niceties out of the way as well, too. So it's time to be a little bit more uh, aggressive with our conversation because I think when it comes to the NWSL, sometimes people just don't like to say what they really think. And I've always been known, correct me if I'm wrong, Rachel, I've always been known to speak my mind. And let's be honest, it's gotten me in trouble a couple of times. Am I, not, am I wrong about that? Maybe once or twice. <laughs> once or twice. I may have broken the internet with TMZ once about Keely Ojai, but that is not at all true because <laughs> she consented to all of that. But that's a whole other conversation. But if people out there want to call me out for bad journalism and all that fun stuff... You can find me on Twitter at Baxter Colburn, and you can find <laughs> Simon at Simon Proven. We'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you people. Anyway, all right, so I want to talk about the NWSL because I think people don't want Sky Blue FC to be successful this year, Rachel. I firmly believe that. What makes you think that? Because the fact that Sky Blue beat Portland over the weekend and continues to do exceptionally well on the season and get limited press surprises me. But it doesn't at the same time 
Because this league runs off of three teams. The Courage, the Thorns, and the Rain. When those three teams are doing really well, everybody in the league is happy. But as soon as an outsider starts to poke their head into the conversation, people aren't exactly thrilled by that. We saw that last year when it was the Washington Spirit kind of poking their heads around. I know the Flash last season as well, too, were kind of that unconventional thought as well, too. But now that they've won, now that a lot of those core gals have asserted themselves, like a Sam Mewis, Lynn Williams, Jess McDonald, and others, I feel like now that Sky Blue... Sky Blue is not a sexy team on paper. They're really not. But they're winning, and they're beating good teams. And I think that really irks a lot of people, but I don't know if there's many people out there that would actually admit to them being really irked. Am I, do, do I, do, am I crazy about this? No, I, I don't think you are. And what I love so much about seeing Sky Blue's success is you hit the nail on the head. You know, on, on paper, they don't have a ton of superstars. But what I love about Sky Blue and, and what they've done down there and, and I've said this for so long, you know, especially at the higher levels, you know, it's about 10% about soccer and about 90% about people management. Mm-hmm. And how well can you get a cohesive team and a team that wants to play together and play for each other? And I think that's what Christy Holly has been able to do. And, and it shows on the field. They have, you know, they have good, solid players, but they don't have, you know, a star-studded roster of standout footballers. And yet they continue to show up and win games. They're well organized. And you can tell that they just really enjoy being together and playing together. And I think that that makes all the difference in the world. And again, look at, I mean, they beat, they beat Portland three to one at home. And for anyone that follows the NWSL, everyone knows Portland is one of the hardest places yeah. to go into and play. That doesn't You're playing happen. In front of, yeah, it doesn't happen. You're playing in front of, you know, a crowd of 20,000 people. It's the best trip to go on, for sure, because you get this great environment. You know, the pitch side seats down there are good. There are these leather recliners. You know, I mean, it's it's all the bells and whistles. But that place, talk about the home of the 12th man. Mm-hmm. Portland has it. They have 20,000 people rallying behind their team. And so for, you know, for a, for a smaller team and a smaller club, really, you know, it's smaller funded. It's not an MLS funded club to go in there and beat them, I think, speak so highly of sky blues program and their leadership and sort of everything that they're doing down in new jersey you know it's a it's a little sleeper town and i think they're they're really you know coming up the curve and it's it's exciting to see i this is what i love about sports so i was very excited to see that result yes and i i was exactly as well too and it's good i think leagues are better when the best teams don't always win I think if the NBA Finals this last year would not have been Cleveland and Golden State, I think the league would have been better for it because it would have proven that there was teams good enough to beat the best teams to get there, which means that there's kind of the shift that we're seeing. I don't know. Oh, go ahead. Well, it just means that you have to show up every single day and play your best game. Exactly. And obviously there's going to be those people that are going to call me out and say, well, Baxter, they've, they've only beaten a couple of good teams a handful of times. I mean, the, the Sky Blues 5-4-1. They've played 10 games. And I get it. They just lost to Portland last week 2-0 at home. But right. Sky Blue was home. I, I get that. I totally get that. I will firmly jump on the Sky Blue camp if they can finish out the rest of this month with with six points. They have to go to Chicago now, who are just a handful of points ahead of them in the standings. Then they have to go back home and take on an, a, a, a surprising Orlando team. I don't know what to make of Orlando, in all honesty, but uh, I asked the question on Twitter this last week as well, too, Rachel, and the results are kind of what I thought it was. I was actually kind of surprised that they were this high. Uh, I asked the question, I said, how many NWSL fans would be mad if Sky Blue FC won the title or at least made the title game this season? 60% actually said that they're completely fine with Sky Blue doing that, but I was surprised that there was a a high number of, it was actually more negative than positive before those last couple of votes came in before the voting closed. Uh, that said, they would rather literally anybody else win and or be in the title game. Why? Why? Why do people hate Sky Blue FC? That's really interesting, and I'm I'm not sure. I think I think for so many sports fans out there, they want to see the top players play. You know, who doesn't want to watch Tobin Heath and Ali Long and you know Henri sort of you know dance on the ball and and do these unbelievable things and. I think part of the reason is, is that sky blue might not play an attractive style of soccer, 
But for me, what I love about them is they're well organized, they're gritty. And as someone who's played, I really appreciate that style of soccer. I love watching teams who are well coached, well organized, and who play as a team instead of sort of depend on the superstars. But as a fan, as a fan of the league, I understand, I think, why people would want to see, um, you know, more flashy players or even, you know, for example, like a Houston, a well-funded club with players like Kalia Ojai, you know, who can, you know, sprint and sort of show off her speed and Rachel Daly. And, you know, I think I think there are teams that play some more exciting soccer. And I think that that's probably why people would rather see that in the final. But yeah. the reason Sky Blue is doing so well is because they're just they're consistent. Exactly, and that's the, the league is so strange with that. And you you get those those hardcore NWSL fans that are just so like, oh, if it's not Portland or if it's not Seattle in the final, then the season was a ruin. And obviously, there's the the the, the Chicago camp that's like, we're relevant. Like, yes, <laughs> we know. But I'm almost I'm also a thousand percent firm believer that if Kristen Press didn't play for the Red Stars, no one would care about that team. Yeah, I mean, am I again, am I wrong back... for saying that? Am I mean for saying that? I think that's a very true statement. Who's on ninety five percent of their marketing? Kristen Press. Right, but you know what I think though? I think I think we're going to start to see a shift and a change. And I I agree with you that I think that she is a big reason why people know about Chicago and know about that team. However, you're seeing players getting consistently called into the national team in the U23s, uh, you know, in Julie Ertz and Casey Short and Alyssa Nair. And for the true soccer fans out there, this is a good team. You know, I love the way Danielle Colaprico plays. And, you know, so you've got some really good, technically very gifted players on this team. And so I think that Chris and Press has absolutely – help to sort of put Chicago on the map. But I think we're going to see a change in that in, in, in the following years. I agree. And I think that's only going to be better for the team and the league as a whole, obviously, if that ends up being the case, of course. So uh, I'm going to get off my high horse in that regards um, with the sky blue in Chicago and all that fun stuff before I completely just dis- decimate all <laughs> listenership. But I, I hope that people... Step on down and tie your horse to a fence, Baxter. I, I, I hope that people realize, though, that I only talk about this stuff because nobody else does. Like, yeah, no, nobody else and talks about this kind of stuff. And that bothers me. Well, and these are things that need to be that need to be talked about. And, and I always find it very interesting, too. Like, when I watch when I watch soccer on TV, the analysts typically tend to be far more critical when doing a men's game than they do of course. in a women's game. Absolutely. And so I think that we need to continue to sort of talk about these issues um, so that we can bring the footballing culture sort of together as a whole instead of, you know, men's soccer and women's soccer. It's, you know, this is soccer and this is how we're watching and we're watching with a critical eye while still acknowledging the fact that these women are unbelievable athletes and incredible players and, again, are humans who, you know, who make mistakes, who take bad touches. But this is sports. This is the game. And, and, you know, this comes along with it. So I think, you know, talking about some of these issues and, and helping to sort of raise awareness is going to be really good for the game. I agree with you on that one. And not to dive into this deeper than we need to, but honestly, in general, from a broadcast perspective, broadcasters are 70 to 80 percent lighter on critiquing women's sports than they are men's sports. You can have the exact same play happen the exact same way in a men's game and a women's game, and you're going to get two totally different calls, which is sad. It should not happen like that. Absolutely. It's it's kind and of especially a, it's kind especially of a as a soccer fan. Especially as a soccer fan, I I want to hear that analysis. I don't I don't want to hear the critique because I think there needs to be more negativity or we need to be harder on the players, but what I would love is for the the commentators to be able to help sort of raise the awareness and to teach people more about the game because we don't have a sort of rich footballing culture like they do in Europe and in South America. And so this is where, you know, once soccer gets on TV, this is where people are going to be learning about it. And so I don't think, you know, there should be criticism and sort of pointing out of mistakes because I'm a very firm believer in, in positive coaching and positive reinforcement. And, you know, any of my girls will tell you that. And anyone who's heard me speak and, you know, you've heard me speak about Julie's book, you know, I'm all about the positivity, but I think that there are, I think that there are teachable moments that, 
that some, and I, I'm going to say some because not all of them do, and I think that there are some very good um, commentators out there in the women's game, but I will say that most tend to um, not not analyze sort of as deeply mm -hmm. as I think the game would allow. Yeah, I would agree with you on that one as well, too. All right, I don't want to spend too much time on this. I want to briefly look back here the week that was. Um, for the games that did take place, uh, as we mentioned, Chicago, uh, a little bit earlier, they drew 1-1 with the Washington Spirit thanks to a, an 82nd-minute penalty kick from Kristen Press. Uh, the Courage got a 3-1 victory over Boston, continuing to prove that without Rose Lavelle, the Breakers are still very irrelevant. Um, FC Kansas City and Seattle got a 2-2 battle draw there. Orlando, they won 4-2. Don't be fooled. This was a 4-0 game before Houston scored two goals in the last couple of minutes of the game. Carly Lloyd's return to the dash was not helpful at all. Uh, and Sky Blue, as we mentioned, the big victory over the weekend, 3-1 over the Thorns. Any of those results stick out to you at all, Rachel, before we look ahead? I think the 4-2 victory uh, with Orlando is is interesting and exciting. Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to watch the highlights or watch the game, but Camilla's mm -hmm. goal from 40 yards out was incredible. And I hope that gets played on every, on every highlight reel and every commercial, because it's, it's just, it's an amazing goal. Um, but, you know, I was surprised with the return of, with the return of Carly Lloyd. And, you know, I thought it was going to be a closer game, mm -hmm. but what I love too, is that Marta, I feel like, has really has really sort of found her her footing in this league and is really continuing to make an impact in each and every game that she's played. I think she's only played in eight games and she has five goals. You know, she's assisting and it's so great to have the world's best player in the NWSL and she's now starting to show exactly what she can do. And my hope for Orlando is that they can continue to to build a team of sort of supporting cast members for her because again right it's a team sport one individual can't do it all on her own um and i think if you find the right people to get around her they could have an incredible team yes i completely agree with you on that i wouldn't even be surprised if orlando finds a way to snag that fourth playoff spot this year as well too they're not better than a portland or a north carolina but they they have that opportunity to with the surging marta and the and camilla as you mentioned and numerous other players to kind of slide into that fourth spot uh, maybe towards the last couple of weeks of the season. So keep an eye on Orlando. They're, they're an exciting team to watch, uh, and I think that you certainly are going to have a lot to cheer for the rest of the way uh, for those Pride fans that are out there. Speaking of Orlando, though, they do get to take on Houston this week. Uh, it's Saturday. They have a home game. The Dash are 2-7. and seven. The Pride are 3-3-3. Three, three, and three. I'm going to give the win to Orlando uh, until Houston basically... I don't, I don't even know, honestly, anymore what Houston has to do at this point. We've talked about the defense, but at this point, the offense isn't even showing up. The goalkeepers are not there. I, I don't know what you can do to fix this. Houston is a mess, and I think they should just take a pass on the rest of the season and try again next year. Can I hop in and answer that question? Please do. Personally, and I said it earlier in the show, I think it's about 10% about football and about 90% about people management. Yes. And I think that if Houston can find a way to sort of pull together as a team, because adversity does one of two things. Adversity either tears a team apart or it pulls a team together. But it's it's sort of the common factor. And if they can find a way to sort of use that adversity as glue and overcome it together as a team, I think we could see a huge turnaround in Houston. But if they can't get that personal piece right, we aren't we aren't going to see it translating onto the field. And it's just going to continue, I personally think, to be a downward spiral for them. I agree with you on that one. And I've spoken with people close to the club, and they've mentioned now that Melissa Henderson is gone. That's a massive positive influence in the locker room that's now gone. So I, I don't really know how you kind of rebound moving forward now that you've lost a key cog in your, in your locker room. Not even necessarily on the field. Henderson, of course, is a great player on the field. But aside from that, that locker room is really what ties a team together. And Carly Lloyd is back now, but Carly Lloyd just won a championship over in England in the Super League with the, FA, with the Women's FA with Manchester City and all that fun business. But I, I, I don't know if Carly's got her head in the right place because she's used to being around successful teams now. I feel like Carly is tainted, and her going to Houston is almost like she's doing the league a favor, I feel like, at this point, to go and spend the next couple of months there 
when she would rather be playing with the national team or she'd rather be playing in England with Manchester City. I think it'll be interesting to see how she how she handles that adversity and and, and the way she chooses to take it on. I think I think it could be a huge opportunity uh, and a growth experience for her. I don't know her personally, um, so I you know I I, I can't speak to um, who she is as a person. But from the outside looking in, I would think that this would be a great opportunity to see if you know she sort of checked off all the boxes on the soccer spectrum. Yeah. But you know now can she add you know leader, uniter, um, you know inspirer, sort of off the field to her resume. Exactly. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how she chooses to sort of attack the situation that she's now been put in. Exactly. All right, quickly looking at the other games before we run for the break. Uh, Boston hosts the Courage. Uh, the Courage are going to continue to roll. That game is at 4 p.m. Eastern time at Jordan Field for those up in the Boston area. Uh, the Spirit are going to play host of the Thorns. Uh, I think that uh, Portland's going to rebound and get a nice little victory there. Uh, when they visit Maryland. Uh, SKC and Seattle get to go back at it again. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I, I think that this is going to be a game Seattle wins, though, um, being uh, the home team. Uh, FK, FC Casey has still been all over the place, in all honesty, for my opinion, with the talent they have on that roster. They've been too shaky. Uh, and they've got the same record as Orlando. Let's not forget about this as well, too. I, I feel like this is going to be a game that Seattle finds a way to sneak away with a victory. And then Chicago and Sky Blue, arguably the game of the week for many people. Uh, that game is going to be on Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern time down in Bridgeview, Illinois, for those that are going to be uh, able to swing down and go check that game out. Uh, any final thoughts, Rachel, before we run to our break? I don't think so. I think just download the Go90 app, watch the league, support it, and uh, I can't wait to see what happens this weekend. Absolutely. All right, we are going to take a break. When we come back, Seattle Reign player Lauren Barnes is going to be here. We're going to chat with her on the shopfutsal.com call in line. Make sure to hang around for that. We'll be back with more on Two Up Front right after this. for this episode. Uh, she actually had to step out of the studio for this interview, so she will not be joining me. Uh, if you've also been listening the entirety of the show, you know that my normal co-host, Simon, is not here either. So uh, this happened last week as well, too, when it came to the interviews. Uh, when, when we had a couple of different people on last week, we had Alyssa Motz on the show last week, and for some reason, uh, both Simon and Rachel were both gone as well during that interview. So uh, either that speaks to me as a co-host or that speaks to them living more exciting lives. I'm not exactly sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that they just live very exciting lives. But, hey, I think it all works out in the end for me because I get to talk to really awesome people. And that's uh, why we love to up front so much as well, too. So uh, it has been quite a while since we have had uh, a player from the Cascadia region on. Uh, we haven't had a Thorns player on in a couple of months. We haven't had a Rain player on in a couple of months either. Uh, and we actually get to uh, check that box today for a Seattle Rain player today. Uh, some of you will likely know uh, this next player for being the 2016 uh, NWSL Player of the Year, Defender of the Year, rather. Uh, she is an anchor for the back line for Seattle Rain. It is Lauren Barnes, and she joins us now on the shopfutsal.com call-in line. A very good day to you, Lauren. Welcome to Two Up Front. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. It's great to have you on the program today, Lauren. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Seattle sitting in fifth place right now uh, in the NWSL standings. Played nine total games, 13 points. Uh, very much in the hunt for that fourth and final playoff spot. Still, obviously, a lot of soccer to play this season as well, too. But uh, talk to us about this season thus far. Uh, what have been some of your, your key takeaways from how the team has performed so far? Yeah, so um, as you guys probably know, we've lost a couple of uh, big players last year, so we we're filling in and some new players, new faces, a lot of new rookies as well, which has been really exciting. Um, I think kind of getting out there, getting um, 
to know each other as well as possible and as quick as possible has kind of been our goal this year. Um, you know, we've always had really good chemistry. It's what uh, Laura's been so great at with this team and building a team. Um, so, yeah, that's been something we've been focusing on this year is just some chemistry and, uh, you know, still sticking to our game. Seattle plays a really nice um, style of soccer, so we continue to do that as well. Absolutely, and we've definitely seen that on display recently. Uh, a 2-2 draw over this last weekend uh, to FC Kansas City. Talk to us about that game a little bit. Of course, as you mentioned, uh, a very back-and-forth game, of course. Uh, coming away with a point, uh, as I always say, a draw is better than a loss, but at the same time, you'd rather take those three points if you certainly can. But talk to us about this hard-fought yeah. draw between FC Kansas City and the Seattle Reign. Yeah, we always say on the road and you get a point when you can. It's an excellent job from um, our side. Uh, it's always hard to go play Kansas City at Kansas City. We both play pretty much the same style of soccer. We love playing out in the back. Um, we love to knock the ball around. So it's really kind of a count mouse game or, you know, a chess game who's going <laughs> to make the least amount of mistakes as possible. Um, and like you said, we came out as a draw. So, um I think it was a big point for us. Uh, we had a pretty tough month of away trips. Um, and, yeah, when you when you could grab those points away, you have to. Um, we would have loved to kind of keep that 2-1 lead, but um, walking away with one, we can't be too disappointed. Absolutely, and I, I think uh, in that regards, anytime you can go on the road, as you mentioned, to uh, to a team that's been a little, a little spotty this season as well, too. FC Kansas City's had to deal with their own injuries and their own coming back into sorts with mm-hmm. the, the re-addition, very briefly, of Amy Rodriguez and, of course, the longer addition of Sidney LaRue as well, too. So, uh, as you mentioned, coming away with yeah. a point on the road is, is never a bad thing from, a, from you know, taking on a, a two-time NWSL champion. Uh, I, I want to ask you about this. Absolutely. This has been a hot topic in the NWSL recently. It's been all these hydration issues, and I, I know that Seattle doesn't have to do <laughs> yeah. with that. You guys are almost too hydrated by all the rain out there, but uh, talk to me yeah. a little bit about what you've seen and heard. Uh, we just saw, obviously, Chicago Red Stars uh, player Taylor Camo go down with just a, a terrible issue. Rachel Daly down in Houston, among others, as well, too. Yeah. What have been your, your thoughts as a player, uh, and are you a little bit more worried to travel to you know Texas or the Midwest to play some of these games for the remainder of your season, especially in the hot summer months. Yeah, it's been really interesting. Obviously, you know, just for us as players, it's it's a health issue when it comes down to it. Um, we want to protect the players in the league, and sometimes playing at those times of the day is not just smart in general. But I also think performance based too. Um, you want to be able to perform at your best as you can, and we want to put on good soccer games for the audience, and that's kind of how women's soccer has to grow as well. And Sometimes when we play these games in the middle of the day, it's kind of hard to show and showcase that. Um, but like you've said, the two people that have gone down and Rachel Daly was in the Houston game while we played them, and it was scary. And um, we don't ever want to see stuff like that happen. And I think, I think the league and you know each club can kind of protect their team and their players as much as possible just by switching times, whether it's even earlier or later. The Kansas City game for us got switched in. It was still hot out there. There's still hydration breaks and hydration issues, and um, especially coming from Seattle, uh, we're not used to that. So it's always kind of like a rude awakening when we get into those um, situations because <laughs> we can't heat train very much up here. Um, we have to prepare in terms of hydration as much as possible, which our trainers and our staff and our team have been doing excellent. Um, we've gone into all these games very prepared and very hydrated, and um, I think that's all we can ask really from the rain, but. It has been a very interesting topic, and um, I just think at the end of the day, it's it's our health, and you want to protect the players as much as you can. Absolutely, and I think that's always what it comes down to at the end of the day. Of course, everybody loves the game of soccer. You wouldn't play it if you didn't love it, but you have to think of yourself as well, too, that self-preservation because soccer is not the end all be all. I mean, a lot of you ladies, if you're lucky, will play till you're 35 or even 40. But you have a life after that. You've got a family. You've got other things that you've got to get onto, and you don't want to put yourself at risk for potential longer term illnesses if you can help it as well too. So making yeah. sure that there's the proper steps Absolutely. taken in place is very important, of course. Absolutely. Aside from that, uh, Lauren, I, I want to look ahead, of course, to a very familiar opponent. Uh, this coming week, you play FC Kansas City again. Uh, so <laughs> it's uh, it's kind of funny how the, sch- the schedule works out like that sometimes. Uh, this time, you get to host them instead of you going there. Does playing a team back-to-back benefit one of the two teams, or is it a benefit at all, or is it kind of an annoyance? Would you rather play a different team this week? What what do you How do you attack a, a basically a back-to-back or a double-header yeah. game like this? Yeah, 
I mean, I think there is some advantages um, for both teams. I mean, you could kind of just look at film and be like, okay, what do we need to do? Um, it's so fresh in our minds as well. Um, you know, and playing at home and playing away is very different, so that there's that issue as well. Um, but I think, you know, going forward, we kind of have to focus on ourselves um, for this next match. Um, and being at home is always a big advantage for us where we do our best, obviously. Um, so I think playing them back-to-back is not very, um, like, not that big of an issue. Um, like I said, it's fresh in our minds, so I think that's just an advantage for both the teams in general. And having um, Kansas City have to travel, you know, you, you just have the time change and things like that. So it'll be interesting. Um, we've done the back-to-back games, um, you know, and maybe – a chance to for um, each team to kind of maybe try out different systems or you know different people in the lineup things like that so it does bring up some um, I think good opportunities for both sides absolutely we're talking with Lauren Barnes of the Seattle rain here on the shop futsal.com call in line uh, stepping away from the rain as a whole I want to look a little bit at your career you've been a part of the Seattle rain since 2013 you were the 10th overall pick uh, their second pick in that draft as well too it, it's not very common in sports as a whole now, and I understand the NWSL, of course, is a little bit younger than most professional leagues, but to see a player with Mm -hmm. the same team for the duration of their career this far, and I understand you've gone on loan during the W League, of course, and and all that other formalities, but Mm -hmm. you've you've been with the same team since your career has started. How much of a benefit has that been for you, especially with the the almost near title victories that Seattle has been so close to the last couple of seasons? Yeah, I mean, just being anywhere for a long time, you get very comfortable. Um, I know Laura well. We've got a great relationship. Um, We've kind of had a core group that's been here since year five as well that she's kept around, and I think that's been our biggest foundation for Seattle Reign. Um, And even just being here, it's it's where I'm meant to be. Uh, Laura really believes in the style that I play and really believes in me as a player and a human, Um, you know, and Outside of soccer, the location's great. Like, I love living here. So it's I'm extremely happy, and I wouldn't want to really be anywhere else. So I'm so excited that I've been here for five years. And I think I'm very fortunate, like you said. It um, doesn't happen very often. Yeah, exactly. And I think that uh, you get that opportunity is, is a huge testament not only to yourself as a player, but also the, the coaching is around you as well, too. One of the last things I want to ask you about, Lauren, yeah. before we let you run, uh, has to stem with your international okay. career. Uh, in 2016, you got a chance to be a part of the She Believes Cup. Um, and my co-host mm-hmm. Simon, if he were here, would ask you the exact question I'm about to ask you. Have you had any other conversations with Jill <laughs> Ellis to potentially make a return back to the national team? I haven't personally have any um, conversations with her. Um, that trip for me was such a great um, experience, um, huge eye opener to really see the level that I need to be at. Um, there is a big jump from the professional level to um, the national side, um, and I am so fortunate to be able to even experience something like that. So um, I'm able to kind of push myself and have a better understanding where I should be. Um, so I'll always be grateful for that opportunity. Absolutely. And I mean, as a as a side note, as I'm looking through some of my notes here as well, too, uh, apparently, I didn't realize this, your your likeness, as they say here, was added to FIFA 16 as part of the U.S. women's national team. Was that kind of a surreal but cool thing to see yourself in FIFA? I don't know if you're a big FIFA player or not, but I feel like that's kind of a, it's got to be kind of a surreal thing to be playing as yourself in a video game for the national team. Yeah, I'm actually terrible at FIFA, but, you know, it is. And it's a, it's a big step for women's soccer in general, you know, not even just as an individual. But it's so cool to kind of just be on the same um, platform as the men's. And, um, you know, the sport is such a worldwide sport. So um, having that added in for women's soccer just is going to help, you know, women's soccer continue to grow. And for me, at, in my age and um, in my career right now, that's really my push for um the growth of women's soccer. So, you know, the youth and everything can kind of uh, experience what we've experienced and continue to pave the path for them. Absolutely. Uh, Last question for me, Lauren, before we let you run. Uh, For those that don't know Lauren Barnes and should get to know Lauren Barnes, what are, what are some of the things that you love to do off the field? What are some of the things that make you, you, what do you, how do you like to spend your free time when you're not, you know, anchoring one of the best defenses in the league? Yeah. Um, I have a lot of hobbies. Um, I just really love, uh, I love people. So I love spending time with my friends and getting to know people and my teammates and um, stuff like that. I'm actually doing a project right now as we speak um, with photography. I'm oh, wow. photographing some of my teammates right now and kind of um, shining light on what they like to do outside of soccer. So 
I have uh, Madeline and Rebecca Stott with me right now, and they uh, just enjoy cooking scones on their spare time. So I'm taking photos of them doing that right now. Ooh, I love a good scone. I we we talk anytime we talk to a Red <laughs> yeah. Stars player, we always ask them about the donuts. So I guess the scones in Seattle are the thing yeah. that we get to we get to talk about as well too. So very exciting. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Lauren, I wanna I wanna <laughs> thank you for taking the time to jump on to up front today, uh, and of course uh, we look forward to, to seeing how the rest of the season plays out for the rain. But uh, would love to have you back on the program sometime if it works out. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. We will talk to you soon. Uh, there goes Lauren Barnes on the shopfootsell.com. Call in line. We've still got a lot more left in the store for you on Two Up Front. Do not go anywhere. We will be back right after this. It's Two Up Front presented by Three Lines Pub. Welcome back to Two Up Front, presented by Three Lines Pub. I am Baxter Colburn. Rachel Wood alongside me today, filling in for the Simon Provan that is out doing numerous different things. Uh, hello again, Rachel. How are you? Hello. I'm great. Oh, good. Oh, good. Uh, some great conversations that we just had on the shopfootsall.com call in line. Uh, thanks to Seattle Rain defender Lauren Barnes for stopping by, making her debut on the program. Uh, and then great to hear from Melissa Henderson as well, too, giving us uh, some more raw insight into why she retired and uh, what she's doing now, looking ahead uh, to her personal and professional career outside of soccer as well, too. So uh, two terrific ladies, uh, two terrific stories, uh, a lot more, of course, to still come in the coming weeks uh, as well. All right, uh, it is time for some MLS. We didn't really talk about this a lot last week uh, just because we were all over the place with time and topics and book clubs and sponsorships and all kinds of craziness. Anyway, uh, all right, looking back at the week that was in Major League Soccer, there was a lot of games that happened. I don't want to spend too much time on it, Rachel, because uh, I want to look ahead, uh, but also talk about some other news things that took place as well, too. But uh, some of the big results, of course, uh, that did take place, there was a lot of U.S. O- Open Cup action that took place. Uh, Orlando City actually lost uh, to Miami FC for those that were uh, big into the U.S. Open Cup. I know Simon, of course, is always a big component uh, for that. So some people were surprised about that. Sacramento Republic actually beat uh, RSL as well, too, 4-1 to one, uh, in that game as well, too. So some pretty crazy ones. But uh, the big games that had a lot of people talking were NYC FC beating Seattle 2-1, uh, David Villa cementing his legacy in Major League Soccer. And I saw the question asked, and I want to get your thoughts about this, Rachel, is David Villa the greatest player to ever play in Major League Soccer now that he's eclipsed 50 goals in his career? Oh, that's a tough one because there have been so many good players, especially not only American players, but players that have come overseas from overseas to play in MLS. And I think if you look just sort of statistically at his numbers, yes, absolutely. But I think that there are so many, so many important aspects that go into being a good player that I think it's, I think it's a challenge to sit here and say, yes, I think he's the best. Yeah. Because there have been so many players who bring so many different components to the game that I personally can't sit here and say, yes, he's the best because, you know, Lampard's come over to play. Um, David Beckham. David Beckham. You know, there are so many of these legends. And just because maybe they aren't scoring goals, but they're setting them up. Or, you know, there are so many different roles to be filled and to be played on the field um, that I think he's absolutely, I think David V is absolutely one of the best, but I can't sit here and classify him as the best. Right. And I would agree with you on that one too. He is an incredible player. Uh, The fact that he's scored so many goals in basically two and a half years, he's not even, he's in year three of his NYC FC deal, uh, but he's obviously not played three full seasons yet. So hats off to him arguably the greatest player currently that we're seeing in the league. So uh, huge respect to him and what NYCFC is doing as well, too. Uh, Atlanta got a 3-1 victory over Columbus Crew, so good to see uh, Joseph Martinez and others uh, back in the scoring round. The Chicago Fire went to New England and dealt them their first home loss of the 2017 season, so a big win for the Chicago Fire. Orlando and Montreal drew 3-3 in a stoppage time goal that helped save Orlando. Toronto continues to roll. Jovinko and Altidore doing their due diligence. Two goals for them as they beat DC United 2-0. San Jose and Sporting ended up drawing 0-0. Kind of a surprising finish there. 
Uh, some might say uh, Colorado got the upset of the week, beating Portland 2-1 to thanks to a late stunner from Alan Gordon because who doesn't score goals after the 80th minute more successfully than Alan Gordon? Uh, RSL beat Minnesota United 1-0 after a great goal from Yuri Marcissian. Uh, Vancouver and FC Dallas with a draw over the weekend, 1-1. The Galaxy and Houston Dynamo also drawing uh, 2-2 after being down 2-0 in that game. Uh, and then the game on Sunday, the Red Bulls got a two-goal performance from BWP as they beat the Union 2-0. Wow, a lot of fun games, a lot of goals, a lot of results. What do you? Were there any games at all that stuck out that you wanted to go back and highlight at all, Rachel? I know like, we, there was a lot that I just kind of threw at you there, but uh, some good games uh, for the soccer fans. I was going to say you could you could be an auctioneer with all those numbers. No kidding, I know it was a, a, stuff all over the place. Honestly, it was it was funny too with all the goals that there was only one game that actually was scoreless, even though there was a ton of goals that were scored over the weekend. Well, and that's one thing that I love about the MLS is that it does it does produce high scoring games. And I think especially for people in America who don't have sort of, you know, soccer history and the sort of, you know, love for the technique and the tactics of the sport, but want to see some action. Yep. I think it's, I think it's great. And the way that the MLS has sort of built itself up and it, you know, it's putting a really great product on the field. And for me, that's, that's incredibly exciting. I agree. I completely um, agree with you on that one too. And it's, it's nice to see not the super teams, not running the league anymore, like the galaxy, uh, Seattle, even Portland for a little while as well too. I know Toronto is still considered the best team in the league and uh, rightfully so, but they've done a great job developing the other players around the Altidores, the Bradleys, and the Giovinkos as well. It's not just those three making the ship run each and every day. Absolutely. And I think if I have to revisit one game, it would probably be the Revs game because I'm up here in the Boston area. Yeah. And, you know, I know a couple of the guys on the Revs, and so I'm always crushed to hear when, when they lose. But, you know, I think they're having a pretty good season. And uh, I, re- I really like the way they play. I like their style. Um and so I'm excited to sort of, you know, to watch them rebound this weekend and to sort of come off that loss and see what um, what sort of fire Jay Heaps has instilled in, into his players. Exactly. Yeah, I'm certainly going to be looking forward to that as well, too. Obviously, never a good time to lose to the fire, especially with the rivalry that is there. But the Revs uh, still have a lot to be positive and thankful about so far this season as well, too. Uh, it is Heineken Rivalry Week this week, uh, so everybody is stoked about that. There is one game... This very evening, we're recording this here on a Wednesday, uh, and we'll likely the show will likely come out later today uh, or tomorrow, depending on scheduling and all that fun business. But DC United and Atlanta take on each other tonight. DC United getting some good news. They are last in the league right now with scoring with 10 total goals, but they have added a dynamic young player in the sense of Deshaun Brown. He has spent time playing for the USL uh, side the Tampa Bay Rowdies. For those that remember Deshaun Brown and his goal-scoring escapades for the Colorado Rapids for a while as well, too, uh, there was a lot of different things that have made Deshaun Brown's career kind of all over the place. But uh, United was able to work out a trade uh, with a couple of different clubs to make that happen. So hopefully Deshaun Brown can come in and give United something to smile about instead of nothing to smile about, but likely doubtful, unfortunately. Uh, we'll have to see uh, what takes place <laughs> in that one. Uh, two games on the Friday as well, too. TFC playing host to the Revolution, uh, FC Dallas, and Houston Dynamo in Viernes de Football. I just like to say Viernes de Football. Uh, that's going to be a fun <laughs> one. That game's on Unimas and on Facebook as well, too, which is pretty sweet. Uh, the Texas Derby there, always a good time. And then the big game that everybody's looking forward to that I still don't think is a full rivalry yet. The Red Bulls and NYC FC, a rivalry, in my opinion, correct me if I'm wrong, Rachel, constitutes one team not destroying the other team consistently for the entire duration of the rivalry. Am I wrong about that? Correct. A rivalry is usually a two-way street, uh, but there are, there are some rivalries that take place based on location that aren't ever, that aren't ever really a rivalry because everybody knows who's going to win. Exactly, and that's that's the hard part about this. The Red Bulls have decimated NYCFC the last three seasons, basically. NYCFC's won once. This could but be. But that's the- what's so great about sports, though, is that you never know. You think you might have an idea, but you never know what could happen, especially in a game of soccer. Exactly, you, know, you could be the team that dominates the entire game, right? But they have one shot, one goal, and you know, there's the game. So, I think. You know, I think what's exciting about that rivalry is, though, even though you think you know, you never fully know. Right, exactly. I need NYCFC 
to, in my mind, honestly, sweep the series or at least take two out of three this season for me to start classifying this as a real rivalry because you can't have Come on, you, David Villa. you can't have a one-way street as you mentioned if the Red Bulls go out and win this game I'm going to continue to stop saying that this is a rivalry because it still isn't because you need both teams to actually have success you know in the in the yep. NFL world the Packers and the Bears or uh, the Patriots and whoever the Patriots rivalry is the Steelers or somebody like that like it's a rivalry because both teams win and they win in big games it's not one team just beating the crap out of the other team consistently for years and years and years not how a rivalry works this is true and i was uh fortunate enough to be a part of one of the greatest college rivalries i think in the history yes uh, between duke and north carolina and you know if you if you if you want to go see what a rivalry looks like take a look at uh, take a look at those two schools and then you know there's nc state sorry for all the wolf packers who are listening but you know they want to get on in on the rivalry but it's it's just not the same you guys are cute you, it, it, you, you guys exactly. can you guys can bring us water at halftime but you can't play <laughs> But the big boys are, yep, UNC and Duke. So. Right, and that was obviously times in your career where Duke won, and then obviously UNC won as well, too. I mean, that, that constitutes a rivalry. You can't, if, you, if one team just decimated the other for three, four, ten years straight, I would stop, even as a player, being like, well, this isn't a rivalry game. We would actually have to you know, lose, or we'd actually have to win a game for this to be a rivalry. Just to set the record straight, I'm pretty sure in women's soccer we always beat Duke when I was there. Probably, but yeah. But basketball is a whole other issue. Well, of course. That's a whole... Basketball is a whole other issue. But, yes, I hear what you're saying. But I would like to set that record straight. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, the other big game that people are going to watch, of course, Sunday is the Timbers and the Sounders. So make sure to go check that out as well, too. Otherwise, a whole spew of games as well, too, for other people to go check out. So you can find all those games on MLSsoccer.com. Last little thing before we run to a final break. Uh, apparently, uh, Guillermo Barrosquiloto, for those that remember him uh, from the Columbus Crew MLS Cup championship team, uh, just helped the uh, Argentinian side, Boca Juniors, win the 32nd title. Why am I telling you this? Well, because he's linked to the new job as the head coach of LAFC. We'll have to see if that actually develops or not. He's a very qualified gentleman, to say the least, to take that position. We're going to go take our final break. When we come back, we'll wrap things up, give you closing thoughts, and peace out. It's Two Up Front. No Simon Provan. I'm Baxter. Rachel Woods here as well, too. Back with more right after this on Two Up Front. Three Lions Pub in Milwaukee, Wisconsin is just the place for me. They've got everything. Great pub food, a wonderful selection of draft beers, and a brilliant atmosphere, especially during Premier League matches. Check out the Three Lions Pub menu at threelionspub.com, where you can also find all their specials and the great events that take place throughout the year. Three Lions Pub, where across the pond is now across the street. Welcome back to Two Up Front, presented by Three Lions Pub. I am Baxter Colburn, joined alongside by Rachel Wood today. Simon Provan has the week off again. We thank you for hanging out with us for this uh, duration of the program. We had a great interview earlier in the show with Seattle Rain defender Lauren Barnes. It was a great opportunity to speak with her a little bit more and get to know all about what she's got going on in her career, but also uh, just get to know her as a person as well, too. Uh, a bummer Rachel had to step out of the studio for that interview, but uh, she, as you guys know, uh, the SoCal girls, they stick together, though, and I'm sure that Lauren and Rachel will find a way to, to have a Valley Girl chat or something at some point. But uh, anyway, hi, Rachel. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Yes, a SoCal girl the country. So I'm like, oh, Cal girl. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Those those SoCal girls uh, have all kinds of fun, that's for sure. But, uh, all right, Rachel, uh, before we get out of here, uh, two other quick little things to hit on. Uh, one uh, is been lighting social media on Storm. The other one uh, is just a general question that I wanted to ask you. Um, so looking over at a recent article um, from SoccerAmerica.com, uh, there is a report out from BBC Sport that uh, there is a little bit of an uprising in women's soccer in England because Manchester United are the only Premier League team that does not have a women's affiliate team. Now, I didn't know this until I saw this article come out, but it makes sense. You hear about the Arsenal women and you know Manchester City and Tottenham and all these other teams, but you always kind of forget about Man United. And then this article pointed that out and basically was asking the question, why? And they don't, United kind of seems to keep dodging the question. What do you think about all this, Rachel? 
Yeah, I was really surprised when I heard that Manchester United didn't have a women's side. And I, I don't know if they really have a good reason. You know, I, I can understand some of the smaller clubs not having not having the funds to support it. Um, you know, and, and, and certain situations like that maybe where uh, women's soccer in some parts of the country aren't as big. But for such a big name club and for such a well-financed club as well, to not have a women's side was incredibly surprising to me. And I, you know, I would be curious um, if they were to release a statement saying why they don't have one, because like you said, you know, we hear about the Arsenal ladies and, you know, their Manchester rival has a great women's side Mm -hmm. who did very well in the Champions League. And it's interesting to me because those two clubs battle back and forth so often that I would want to think they would, you know, we talked about rivalries earlier in the show, you know, sort of go tit for tat in, in, in every aspect, in the youth aspect, in the men's aspect. Um, and I, I would think the women's side. So that was that's really surprising to me. And I, I'm shocked and and don't understand why they don't have one. Yeah, and that's the thing too. Looking at this article that uh, Rachel Brown Finnis uh, reported from BBC, she said that United will not properly explain their position on why they don't field a women's team. Uh, it used to be Southampton and Manchester United that didn't have a women's team, but now Southampton has at least announced that they are going to have a U21 team starting next season. Uh, that'll give pathways for at least younger women's uh, players to be a part of this squad. But United continuing to dodge around it. Uh, It just seems surprising to me that England is such a a budding hub of soccer as a whole. And as you mentioned, too, you've seen so much success from Manchester City that that should be motivation enough for Manchester United to want to put a female team on 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 the field. So it's a little fishy to me personally, and we'll see if they decide to to do that here in the next couple of years as they continue to face more pressure. But, yeah, very, very surprising in all honesty. And um, I don't really know how to describe it, I guess. it's you'd, you'd like to expect better from a power club like Manchester United. You know, and hopefully hopefully we see in, in the future with the culture of women's soccer changing and just how popular the sport is becoming that, that Manchester United does decide to hop on the bandwagon and you know, and support women's soccer because I think that they have so many resources and they could really help continue to grow the game that I think it would be a huge plus for them to have a women's club. Yep, I would agree. All right, last thing here before we get out of here. There is a buzz around the social media world, uh, and there's a big debate going on on a lot of different platforms as well, too. If you haven't seen these pictures, uh, Jermaine Jones is uh, has been photographed holding a Chicharito jersey and wearing a Giovanni Dos Santos jersey. Uh, now, for those that obviously know, Jermaine Jones and Dos Santos are teammates for the LA Galaxy. Uh, but these aren't LA Galaxy jerseys that he's wearing. They are Mexico jerseys. Uh, and Jermaine Jones has come out saying that he is supporting Mexico for the Confederations Cup right now. Not in the World Cup, not in the Gold Cup, not any of that. Just in the Confederations Cup right now. And social media and soccer heads as a whole are very <laughs> divided on this right now. Uh, and I'd love to get your thoughts about this because this is the USA Mexico rivalry is huge. But in, in general, in any sports, and we talked about this off the air as well too, Rachel. You're you're a Patriots fan. I'm a Packers fan. If we saw our respective quarterbacks wearing jerseys of our rival teams, if Aaron Rodgers was out in a Bears jersey or Tom Brady was walking around in a Jets jersey or a Steelers jersey, I'm pretty sure a lot of people would would have a big issue with it, regardless of whatever the intent of that player was how do you view this situation and how do you did you react especially with such a polarizing figure like jermaine jones wearing two very high profile mexican player jerseys sure so i think i'm in an interesting position to answer this question because yes i'm a former professional athlete but all all professional athletes and all of these high level athletes are people and for me in, in my life, especially in my sport, but also in my work and what I do, relationships are so important. And I feel that if you have a connection to somebody and you want to support them, um, then I think that that's great. I also think that that by Jermaine Jones wearing these jerseys, I think it's actually awesome. I think that it shows that he's supporting, um, you know, CONCACAF, the North American teams, um, you know, the teams that, that he plays against. And I think that that, I think that that really shows a high level of sportsmanship and respect um, to be able to root for someone that's sort of, you know, in your, in your sort of global sphere, if you will. So, yes, we, yes, we play against um, 
we play against Mexico. And yes, they're a big rival, but at the same time, right, they're the, they're the only other you know, American team. They're the only other CONCACAF team in the Confederations Cup. And so I think it's cool that he can support our federation in the cup while, you know, while still, if, you know, if we were to play Mexico, can still go out there and say, no way, like, I want to win. Um, you know, I play for the USA. So I don't, I don't actually have a problem with it. I think, you know, obviously if it's a game against, you know, USA versus Mexico and he's wearing a Mexican jersey, okay, then yes, maybe some people would have a problem and I, and I would sort of raise an eyebrow to that. But I think that that speaks to sort of his, to sort of his class and character. And, you know, he's got teammates on that team and you build these relationships with your teammates and, and, you know, we're all just people. And so I think to be able to support his friends and I get that it isn't an LA galaxy Jersey, but his teammates right now aren't playing for the galaxy. They're playing for Mexico and they're playing for their country. And I think he understands what an honor that is. And so for me, it almost feels like respectful that, you know, he's got his teammates. He wants to support them. He wants to support, um, CONCACAF, the league, um, the game in general. So I don't, I don't actually have a problem with it. I think it's, I think it's great. I think it's classy. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of it. So, yeah. And I definitely hear what you're saying in that regards. And I, I can see both sides in this as well too, because that's, that's happened for me. I mean, how many times do you see this even, even growing up in, in youth sports? I mean, the guys or gals that you play high school soccer with, are sometimes not the same guys or gals that you play with uh, in club soccer. You know, like your your team changes all the time, right. but, but when you when you come together, then a lot of the a lot of those club people that you play with are on various high schools around the area, so you don't get to play with them. So when you and your schools play each other, or you go to that game in support of your best friend or one of your good friends, that doesn't mean that you are you know hating on your school or your country in this instance. And and that's that's the thing too. I mean, I think that this is definitely a good move from Jermaine because it shows that this is more than just a game as well too. I think so many people get caught up in sports and it's like this is a way of life like it's it's really not like if lebron james showed up in a golden you know in a golden state warrior steph curry jersey tomorrow like just you know out in miami or wherever the heck he is like that doesn't necessarily mean that he all of a sudden is leaving the Cavs for Golden State. Like, yes, the media would have an absolute, you know, firestorm of a day with it. But if he and Steph Curry are friends and he's just showing support for, for Steph or, or whatever, like, that that's okay. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're selling your soul or you support them. Like, obviously, when Jermaine is in the USA-Mexico game, he is a thousand percent the United States. You know, Mexico is the enemy in that regards. But it's it's so interesting to see how so many people get so divided on stuff like this because what he means to the country. I wonder if this would have been somebody else, like if, um, if Stephen Fry or if, you know, Bill Hamid or, you know, Clarence Goodson or, you know, you, you start throwing out these, these smaller guys or Dax McCarty or others that, but if they would have done this, how they would have been thought after. Or maybe we wouldn't even been talking about it as much and people would have kind of laughed it off. Or if, I mean, if Christian Pulisic would have shown up in a Mexico jersey, I think people would maybe have laughed it off, but at the same time been like almost been more offended because he's this new golden boy for the United States culture. But it's uh, something like this people don't need to waste their time on honestly and not get too not too wrapped up into it he's like you said he's supporting his friends and at the same time it's not like this is the usa mexico game that he's doing this ahead of he's doing it in a competition the united states has literally nothing to do with so i have no problem with it either honestly absolutely i think it's good for the sport i think it shows good sportsmanship good character and that's you know and that sports is so much more about winning and losing it's 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 about the relationships Exactly, and I think that's what some people oftentimes forget in in the sports realm is that these guys are really a lot of friends more than anything, and these rivalries and this hatred that we as fans and the media try to uh, instill is a lot of times fabricated out of nothing when a lot of these guys don't want anything to do with that. They just want to play the game and hang out with their friends and not think you know not think twice about it, and that's unfortunately not the world we live in right now, which is a sad thing to think about at times. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, Rachel, uh, we got we to gotta run. This has been a, a lot of fun. We've covered a lot of ground today, of course. Uh, and I want to thank you for taking the time to co-host again with me this week. Uh, you're two for two in uh, phenomenal substitutions uh, and doing a great job uh, on the air for Two Up Front. Uh, how are, uh, do you have any great plans for the rest of the week at all or anything else coming up or any games that you're going to be watching this weekend by chance? Um, so I'm going to be watching definitely the NWSL games. Um, I am going to continue coaching all my players, uh, hobbling around in my boot that I'm currently wearing. In a boot? Because I injured, 
I injured my foot playing like every good soccer player does at some point. Unbelievable. Um, and I just plan on enjoying the weather. So thank you so much for having me on. I've had a blast. And anytime you guys need a sub, let me know. We got you. Well, it's always a pleasure, Rachel. And we are very grateful for Two Up Front's best friend being our best substitute co-host as well, too. So uh, cheers to you. And uh, we look forward to having you back on the show again sometime soon, Rachel. Thank you so much. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Absolutely. And thank you to all of you wonderful people out there as well, too, for taking the time to tune in. A special thanks to Seattle Rain defender Lauren Barnes for stopping by the program. All of our guests do appear on the shopfutsal.com call in line. Two Up Front is presented by Three Lines Pub. If you want to get at us on social media, you can find us on Facebook. Go over there, give our page a like, tell your friends about us as well, too. And, of course, you can also find us on Twitter at Two Up Front Soccer, at Baxter Colburn, at Simon Proven. If you want to follow Rachel, it's rmwood24. You can go find her on Twitter as well, too. For those that are looking forward to the Milwaukee Torrent Games this upcoming weekend, uh, Friday night, it's the Torrent taking on the Michigan Stars. I'll be on the call. Simon will be off. He'll be back on Sunday, though. Uh, as we've got another big game on Sunday at 3 p.m. Uh, against Detroit City FC. So some big games for those Torrent fans out there. They got a big win the other night, 3-1 against FC Indiana. So the Torrent season continues to roll along as well. Two for Simon Provan and Rachel Wood. I'm Baxter Colburn saying we'll see you guys next time on Two Up Front with our manager being the one above. We are Two Up Front.